Hello, and welcome to today's webcast entitled, IT is from Venus, Non-IT is from Mars, Bridging the IT and Business Leader Divide to Improve the Business Value of IT. My name is Jeff, and I will be your event specialist today. During the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation. Please click on the Q&A icon in the lower left-hand corner of your screen to type your question into the open space and click the Send button to submit to our presenters. If you would like to view the presentation in full screen view, you can click on the full screen button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and you can press the Escape key to return to, return to a, your original view. Finally, for optimal viewing and participation, please disable your pop-up blockers. Should you need any technical assistance as a best practice, we suggest you first refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key on your keyboard. If this does not resolve the issue, please click on the menu button in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and select Support for online troubleshooting. It is now my pleasure to turn today's webcast over to Peter Hurst, Executive Director, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, everyone, and greetings from the MIT Sloan School of Management here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, this is the second MIT Executive Education webinar in our Innovation at Work series, uh, and uh, I'm delighted that we have 900 people or more who have registered for this webinar, uh, so hello uh, to you all. I'm sitting here with Dr. George Westerman, research scientist at the MIT Sloan Center for Digital Business, uh, and also a, a leader and teacher in uh, our executive education program here at MIT. Uh, Dr. Westerman uh, is uh, a prolific researcher uh, in uh, issues of uh, IT uh, management and how businesses use IT. Uh, he's the author of uh, two uh, very well-received books uh, that are both uh, have been in the top 10 IT books uh, in the world. Uh, one of which is uh, partly the subject uh, of uh, today's uh, talk by George, which is IT is from Venus and non-IT is from Mars. Uh, so with that, I would like to hand over to George uh, and uh, ask him to explain quite what he means by that. Thanks, Peter, and, uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming and spending some time with us. Uh, really happy to be able to share this research with you. Uh, we've done uh, research on this topic of the IT and the business relationship now for over seven years, and uh, it, one answer keeps coming out, which is that while the technology is important, the relationship is just as important, and the relationship actually can be often hardest to do. Uh, the good thing is, in our research, we're finding there are some steps you can do to make it happen. So if we think about it from a relationship side, you got two parties involved, Mars and Venus, and in, in our case, it's the uh, IP and the non-IT executives who have to work together to get value from IT. And any managed, marriage counselor is going to tell you that there are two sides to every story. And two sides is okay, but each side needs to understand the other. Uh, when marriages suffer, when any relationships suffer, it's really that the two sides can't find ways to communicate, can't find ways to resolve their misunderstandings. Because you're going to have misunderstandings, but in the good relationships, you have ways to handle that. Okay? So think back to your own relationships. Um, they're bad ones, they're good ones. Uh, the good ones, they're really good. You want to do things for them, they want to do things for you. You know enough about each other that you can make things happen, uh, that you can help each other out. And what's more important is that you're better with them than you are without them. Um, and so relationships take work, but if it's a good one, it's really worth doing that work. Then you got the bad relationships. And in the bad ones, well, you got constant struggles. You've got misunderstandings. You're arguing. You just can't see eye to eye. And if it's a relationship that you can't leave, everybody just gets more and more miserable. And unfortunately, in many companies, that's exactly the problem we have. The IT and the business relationship, it's a very, very troubled marriage. You've got constant storms over how the money is spent. You've got constant finger pointing when anything bad happens. And as far as when anything good happens, well, good things just don't happen very often. And that's a real problem. But you're, you've got to work together. To me, that relationship is essential if you're going to really take technology and drive companies. And in most companies today, if you can't make technology work, your competitor is going to, and, and you're going to be left in the dust. So what can you do? What can you do about a relationship? Well, we found these kinds of marriages, they can be saved. 
In four separate studies, we found a single good driver of the IT business relationship. And uh, for example, we surveyed 153 non-IT executives about the state of IT in their organizations. We gave them 18 IT and non-IT management tasks. And one was by far the most important driver of business value from IT. And that one, the one that signs sunlight on the whole relationship, is transparency. Transparency can turn these bad relationships into good. And how does it do it? Well, it, it overcomes suspicion, it helps you communicate, and it helps you move forward together. So, for example, what we found in these research is that you can have the greatest IT department in the world, but if the business side doesn't understand what's happening in IT, if they don't understand how to work with IT, they see it as a really bad IT department. And on the other hand, if the IT department is really not so great, put transparency in, things get better really fast. And so that's what we want to talk about now here, is how can you put some transparency into the relationship? Because if you can communicate clearly about what you're doing and why, you can make the relationship a bit better. But that means that you're talking with each other about what you're doing, talking with each other about the challenges you're facing and how to solve them, instead of talking past each other about how one person's getting in the way. So why don't we just uh, ask a couple of really quick relationship questions just to, to figure out who's on, in the room today. Uh, if you could, uh, Jeff, could you uh, push the first question? So we have these polling questions here, and uh, there's, you, it'll come up on your screen. And you'll have a quick question. So the question here is, do you consider yourself an IT person or a business person? Uh, we have a mix of people in the room, so let's see how people are. So just do your quick vote and push the vote button, and then Jeff will tell us what the results say. Now, uh, if you've joined us late, uh, or if you're having trouble seeing the slides, uh, the F5 key will refresh your browser. And usually, if you're having trouble seeing the slides, that's the first thing to try. And then there you can also try to help things if, if other problems happen. So Jeff, how do the answers look here? We seem to have an IT problem. Oh, there it is. Well, look at that. Doesn't get any better than that. So if we're talking about a relationship between the IT and the business side, uh, it's 50-50. Um, that's a good mix of people. So what I'll be talking about is both sides of the relationship and how you uh, as a group can communicate. Uh, the IT people communicating with the business side and the business people understanding more about how to communicate with the IT side. So let's ask another question here just to kind of understand where you're standing. If you're half IT, half non-IT people in the room, Jeff, can you push that next question out? There we go. So how would you characterize your IT and business relationship? Is it really sweet, sweet love? Uh, is it okay, but you're kind of holding your options open? Or would you just say it's a total train wreck? Uh, do a quick vote and let's see where you stand. In, in a lot of organizations, the relationship actually can get better fast, um, but it takes some recognition to figure out where you are to start both in terms of where the relationship is and in terms of where the, uh, what the performance and the value is that you're getting from IT already. So how do the numbers look there, Jeff? Oh, man, we've got a lot of people playing the field. Um, not the best idea because you only have one IT department. You only have one company. So playing the field uh, is not the best way to get commitment towards moving forward. Um, but at the same time, I understand very much where you're coming from. Uh, the other thing that's interesting in this situation is that uh, we have twice as many train wrecks as we do sweet love. Um, hopefully we can fix that. So thanks, Jeff, for, for doing that poll, and thanks all of you for answering the poll. Let's take a look now. Given that situation, uh, that we've got a lot of relationships that aren't working yet, what can we do? Now, I've been using the analogy of a marriage, and in many ways, you know, a marriage counselor would say the same thing, that's communication. If you can communicate, and if you want to solve the problem, you can. Uh, but I'm not going to ask you to lay on a therapist's couch and open up your heart to the world. This is business. And so the kinds of communication you have are, are much less about feelings and much more about value and performance and decision-making processes. In fact, we found four areas that are the biggest places where miscommunication happens between IT and business people. 
And what I want to do in the next couple of slides is just go through each of these four areas. What do the symptoms look like? And what are some examples on, on how you can do something about this? So the four areas you'll see there, uh, IT cost and performance, uh, risk management, prioritization, and accountability. So let's just go through those one at a time. Here's the first one. The symptom, the business side is saying, IT costs too much. We're not getting the service that we're paying for. The IT side, on the other hand, is saying, listen, for the money you give us, we're actually doing really well. Now, who's right in this situation? Business people or the IT people? In most companies, there's absolutely no way to know because there's no, no information to know. So what you have is, is business people seeing a lot of money and not necessarily seeing what they want out of IT. And you've got IT people feeling really under pressure to do what they're doing and maybe not necessarily recognizing the business impacts of some of the technical issues that we run into. So what do you do about that? Put some transparency in. Try to figure out what actually is happening with IT costs and performance. Because whatever it is, you can get better. But if you don't know, it's only going to get worse. So let me share an example with you on this. Uh, Intel. 1998, uh, Intel ran a contest. Oh, so let me just say it this way. Uh, in, on April Fool's, Intel every year runs a, a uh, headline in their employee newsletter. That's a complete joke. And you've seen this in other places, these, in, these April Fool's stories that draw you in and then you realize they can't possibly be true. You get a good laugh out of it. Uh, at Intel, April 1st, 1998, um, the headline of the employee newsletter said, IT at Intel wins an achievement award. The entire company laughed, uh, except for the IT people, of course. And that's the situation. That's how bad it was. And to the credit of Doug Bush, who was just coming into the, the role as the CIO, he realized that while the IT people were not happy about this comment and while the business people were laughing their heads off about the comment, neither one was really – it was just a symptom that the relationship was broken. And Rather than saying, listen, guys, it's not that bad and making a big fuss, Doug said, let's go out and study it. So he went out and benchmarked. Uh, Doug and the IT staff went out and benchmarked where they were. And you can see on this picture quality and unit cost compared to other semiconductor firms. Now, in 1999, when they did this, all of those bubbles for all the different services they offer were in the worst in class area. They were in that white section. They looked horrible. And frankly, a lot of the IT people were happy to really, they were really worried about it, and they were hoping to do what you know, a lot of kids did with their report cards uh, back in junior high, maybe hide it in the bed or find a way to lose it. And Doug said, no, we need to show this to people. When he showed it and said, listen, you're right, things are bad. They're, they're worse than I thought they were, but we're going to do something about it. He said it completely changed the nature of the conversation. It wasn't, yeah, you guys are a bunch of jerks. It was, hey, you recognize what our, the pain we're facing. Now let's figure out what we're going to do about it. And by changing the nature of the conversation, things started to improve quickly. So here, four years later, you can see everything in there is best in class. That's because they had a mechanism now to under, so both sides could understand what was happening and so they could understand where they want to go. And what's really interesting about this is now, as it, when the, when the report, report card got to looking this good, the conversation changed again. One thing that happened is if somebody started saying, my service isn't good enough, Doug can say, hey, it's already best in class. How much more do you want to spend on this? Very different conversation. And second of all, people stop paying attention to this because they realized that things were really pretty good. Let's get on to the bigger problems in, in fixing the IT business relationship and getting value from IT. So the first issue here is to figure out what is IT cost and performance. Get clear on it, and then you can do something about it. And we've seen this same thing take place not only at Intel, but in a large auto retailer, another semiconductor far, uh, firm, credit card company, a mail order firm, and literally dozens of others. To first figure out the situation, then you can fix it. So that's the first area where people get confused. IT cost, IT performance. Here's another one. 
risk management. Now, the risk management conversations almost never take place in terms of risk management. They tend to look at it this way. The business side says, I want it this way. I want to use my new tablet everywhere I go. I want my software to be customized to exactly the way I want it. And IT says, you can't have it that way. That's not a good conversation. What that ends up getting you into the situation where CIOs are often known as the CI no. They're the ones who always don't give you what you want. And frankly, they don't like being in that situation, but it's really a risk management problem. So what, what's the biggest driver of risk in companies? Our research is showing that the biggest driver of risk is unmanaged complexity. Every time the business asks for an exception, that adds complexity to IT. That makes it harder to program, makes it harder to fix when it breaks, makes it harder to change when you're going forward, and it makes it harder to test for anything. In other words, every time you ask for an exception, what you're really saying is, let's create more security problems, let's create more problems that are keeping the, to keep them running, and let's create more problems of agility and flexibility for this company. The short-term exception means long-term problems. And that's, that's where why this is a risk management problem. The CIO doesn't want to say no. But the CIO does need to say, let's do this in a way that we can make it work for our long-term good. So, for example, in an energy company, a big utility company, the CIO says, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you want. Give me a month, and I'll get back to you. And when the CIO comes back a month later, he's got a couple of really smart people that work up these cases. He comes back and says, here's what you wanted. Here's what it will cost. Here are the risks involved. Here's two other ways to do it that will get you close to what you want, and it will be better for the company. Then he's not saying no. He's saying it, here's a better way. That's a better, that's a better way to work this thing. Because what's happening is IT, as, as much as you want the, uh, your projects to get done, IT has to manage a whole set of risks. And so whether they have this chart or not, the vertical axis here is the impact if a risk happens, turns into a bad thing, if an incident happens. And the horizontal axis is the likelihood of that happening. So an earthquake would be that big orange thing at the top left. Major project failure might be one of those things in the pink area. Now, if your IT organization does not have this kind of a chart, they should. Because if you're on the IT side, this helps you communicate your risks. And if it's on the business side, this helps you understand the risks that the company is facing. But beyond that, I think there's another conversation, a very good conversation you can have to get at this issue of I want it this way and you can't have it that way. And that's to come to some, some uh, common understanding about where the risks are coming from in your company and which ones are most important. Uh, in, in the book, IT Risk, we talk about four risks that face the company from IT. And these four, just for fun, we call them by four A's. But they are availability, which is keeping things running and bringing them back up if they, if they go down. Access, which is making sure the right people have information and the wrong people don't. Accuracy, meaning do you have that single view? Does, do, you know that, do you know what's actually happening in your company? Uh, and for anybody that cares about regulation, Sarbanes-Oxley definitely falls in here. But also the single view of your supply chain, the single view of your customers. And the last, really the most important risk that many of the business people feel and the IT people don't understand the importance of it, is agility. How fast do you need things done, and how fast are they really getting done? Now, what I would recommend you do on the risk management thing to resolve this problem, first off, is to sit down with your favorite person on the other side of the aisle. Uh, business person, find your favorite IT person. IT person, find your favorite business person. And say, listen, how important is each of these A's for the part of the business that you're running? And then say, how well are you managing each of these A's? I guarantee it'll be an interesting conversation. And for most companies, you'll find that you actually aren't as aligned as you want to be on these A's. So it's a great chance to educate each other on what's really going here. If the, if the business side wants more agility, the IT people could tell all the complexity that's stopping that. And if the IT people want to manage some of the other risks, access or availability, 
they can make the case for why how important that is and what needs to be done about it. So although it seems like the CI know, what it really is is the CI risk manager. And you need to have a way to have that conversation. These four A's are a way to do that. So we've been through two of the four of these four uh, these areas where people can disagree. Um, do, do we have any questions coming in that we want to talk about? Sure, thanks, George. So one uh, one question seems to be uh, given a couple of examples from the for-profit uh, sector, uh, and uh, we're just wondering: are there any other uh, cases or examples that uh, you're aware of in the not-for-profit world that would apply to this particular situation? You know, it's really interesting because many of the nonprofits people say, well, it, especially for some of the risks that are coming up, uh, some of the conversations that are coming up, how do we compute a business case for a, for a, a government organization? Um, your business case just has different sources of value, whether it be co- uh, client satisfaction, whether it be meeting your mission goals, whether it be ma- meeting your cost goals. Um, every organization has some objectives it's managing to, and it's a matter of getting those straight. Now, in government, it's actually government and nonprofit having the conversation about what is IT performance and what are the risks is actually more important, I would say, than in the IT, in the non in the for-profit area, because the for-profit area, I think you can get alignment a little faster. In the not-for-profit area, often people's interests are diverging, and so if you don't sit around and have a good, strong conversation about it, those divergent interests are going to lead to all kinds of misunderstanding and, and issues. So have these conversations and go on. And as you go also into the business case stuff we're about to get into, um, figure out what is it that's non-monetary that you might be measuring, like customer satisfaction. And just to uh, help me understand here, mm-hmm. we're not just talking about conversations that, uh, that, that IT managers and leaders need to be initiating, but also that business leaders need to be initiating these conversations as well. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, if you're really upset with your IT department, the last thing you should do is sit around and just seethe in silence. Um, you wouldn't do that with your sales department. You wouldn't do it with your manufacturing organization. Sit down and, and have, find a way to have a conversation with the CIO and be really clear about what it is, what's working for you and what's not. And then be open to have some, to give some help in how to change the way they communicate. Because frankly, many CIOs have come up through the technical things. They've never actually been in those executive level conversations that you have every day. And, but what they are is really good problem solvers. So if you help them figure out some ways that you want to be talked to, the IT people will figure that out. Now, the best IT people get it, but many of the others have a good conversation. They'll find a way. Well, that, that definitely makes sense. Uh, so I think that you, so you framed up this, this question as being about relationships and uh, the importance of communication and transparency in, in, in these relationships. Uh, so you know, we're at MIT. We're very much concerned with how we practically do things as well and put them into effect. How do we do that? So I think the first thing you want to do is take a look at these four that we're sharing and figure out where are the biggest hot spots for misunderstanding. And I'll put some of these tools in place. Uh, And even before that, just recognize that although it's a relationship problem, it does not need to be overly hard to solve. If you can start the right kind of transparent communication like this, you'll get there. So aim, aim for transparency and then use some of these tools to make the change happen. Great. So uh, why don't we take a take a look at some more of these things? Biggest issue number three is prioritization, and it often takes this form. Form the business side says, "I need this right away," and the business uh, the IT side says, "Sure," but three other executives just told me the same thing. What you have here is a common problem in organizations. And it's that there's more demand than supply. But you have an IT executive who has, doesn't have a lot of power to say what is going to happen when and who does know that if they make you happy, there's probably three other people that are going to be unhappy because of that. Um, there needs to be a better way to make these prioritization decisions. And the right way to do it is not to have the IT person saying no to, to you all the time. Uh, what we've done... Uh, in our research is, is trying to figure out how to do this better. 
And in fact, that, that study that talked about transparency identified four tasks that are most associated with value. And what's interesting about these four tasks is there really are about this, what we call the virtuous cycle of IT value. What we mean by that is if you can do the, start this cycle the right way with transparency in it, it gets better and better every time. But if you don't have the transparency in it, you keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So if you look here, you start with needs identification. What is it that the business wants from IT? And then you go through a very disciplined investment phase. What's essential here is to be really clear on what you want and why you want it. In fact, we thought many of you do business cases on, the, uh, on your IT investments. But most business cases are magic. Most business cases are, imag are imagination. And they're created only to jump over a hurdle, and nobody ever looks at them again. What we want in this case instead is real business cases based on real numbers. What measures in your company, whether it's inventory turnovers, whether it's head counts, whether it's customer satisfaction indexes, what numbers are you really going to move with that investment? So then you can go back and figure out whether those numbers actually did move. So when this cycle works, the needs turn into a disciplined investment process where we look at exactly what measures are going to move and how much money that's going to generate. And then once, after you implement, you get to the harvesting value stage where you do a real review to see whether it happened. Now, if you're like most companies, you don't do those post-implementation reviews, those harvesting reviews. And if you don't do them, you're asking for the prioritization process to become political, to become dishonest, and to award the most money to the person who yells the loudest. That's not what you want. Nobody's happy in that situation, including the person who's yelled the loudest, because they might not yell so loud the next time. What you want is a situation where it's transparent what you're investing in and why, and then it's much clearer on what investments are there. And the only way to put that transparency in is to close the loop at the end. So one company, for example, the CIO does not say yes or no. The CIO has put a process in place. So business units put together, with IT, they put together a case for what they want. And the business unit leader stands up and says, I need $2 million for this situation. The CFO says, how will you measure it? The colleagues ask lots of questions, and then they get their money. A year later, the person needs to come back and say, I got my two million, I promised you four million measured this way. I actually got three and a half, and here's why. That kind of transparency is great because, first of all, people become more honest in what they're signing up for. Two, they don't sign up for a project. If the questions lead to, if the questions at the beginning start saying, you know, we're not really sure what we're doing or I'm not really sure what I'm doing, they'll withdraw the request until they know their answer. This idea, good, strong business cases with measurement at the end, is how to put transparency in the process, how to fix prioritization. So actually, George, one question that just is uh, coming in from our participants on that topic, um, just to expand a little bit, uh, was how, I think of the example, practical example of a bank software system, uh, how can, what approaches can you take to that kind of challenge of the making the business case when you can't really quantify what the risks are? You know, what is the quantifiable risk of a, of a small bug in the bank's financial system? Okay. So the risks are, uh, can be hard to quantify. Uh, you, usually with the risk, you, you talk about them in small, medium, and large buckets. Um, and that's, that's an easier thing. So, for example, the, the, the uh, chart I showed you on the risk on the last slide uh, they have, I believe, four buckets in one and five buckets in the other, and very clear. If it's less than $100,000, it counts as small. If it's more than a million dollars, it counts as large. And that way, you can find the buckets easier. So that's the number one. Number two is the business case for the project itself. If you are in an organization where they say, we can't quantify the value of this, the next question to ask is, think again. Because if you can't quantify the value why are we doing this? Now, some things, like regulatory compliance, you're stuck with it. The only value is you get to stay in business. But everything else should move an indicator. You should be increasing sales. You should be improving uh, operational efficiencies. 
you should be able to point to things that are going to happen and, and how. And then you go make those things happen. So the idea that this is not quantifiable um, sometimes it's not, but in most cases it is. And executives, senior executives are good at making estimates and meeting those estimates. Do it here too. So we have one more of these areas for, for miscommunication, and it's an important one, and it links up with the prioritization piece. It's accountability. We've talked a little bit about accountability here um, with the post-implementation reviews, but there's a lot more accountability that goes on. Um, and what happens here is you tend to have the CIO has a lot of responsibility to make things happen in the organization but they have no, no authority to make many of these things happen. So, so you have people feeling a lot of pressure to do it right without a lot of help sometimes. So what you hear is this question. Why do you make me go through all of this bureaucracy? Why do I have to jump through all these hoops whenever I want to do anything? And what the IT people are saying is, our methodologies are the way we make sure everybody does the right thing. Now, do IT people abuse this a lot? Oh, yeah. If your methodologies are overly difficult, if your business cases run 50 pages instead of three or four pages, then this is they're overdoing it here. And there's room on both sides. What you want to do is have this, these things be as clear as possible on everybody's roles, but also as easy as possible to execute through. So here's the problem you've got. If the, if the CIO has responsibility to make things happen but not authority, here's, uh, they also have two goals where the business side might only be managing one. On the business side, often you're thinking about strategic change. What do I need to make happen now to, to help improve this company? The IT people have to, have to manage two things, not only the strategic change, but also operational resilience. How are they going to keep things running for the next 30 years while, while you're going off and finding new things to change? The CIO has to manage both of these, where the project that you're talking about often is only thinking about strategic change. How do you fix that? Through methods. So what you want to, want to, what you want to make sure when the projects are being built is not only that the system is built, but other things are happening. Because it's too easy to think that when the system is built, that the job's done. But what about managing the organizational changes so that you can use this system well? What about reconfiguring your processes so they can be more efficient because this technology is in there? What about managing the security of this as you're rolling this out to new people, new, new regions? And what about maintaining it forever? Because these things rarely go away once they're in. That's what these methodologies are about. Now, really, so but the question is, how can you do the methodologies without making everybody miserable? And Rebecca Rhodes at Raytheon found a really interesting way to do this. Um, Raytheon does a lot of good work on projects in, in the projects that they do when they're building systems for the defense department, this kind of thing. And what she did is she said, why are, why are we making the IT methods be a different process than what the business already knows? So she took the business's product development process and put IT in that language. And the amazing thing that happens, she said, is that once that happened, everybody knows exactly what they have to do on an IT project. They know what questions to ask. They know what answers to expect, because they do that all the time in their own product development. Suddenly, everybody's speaking the same language for IT, and the IT projects go better. So whatever it you have in your organization that works well as a process, whether it's your capital investment process, your product development process, whatever, Find a way to link into that, because IT shouldn't be a separate world. You should be doing this together in a language you can understand. So if there are four areas of, of, of problems in the organization, we should really take a look at what, which ones in this are most important in your area. So Jeff, can you pull that, push that last poll question? And while Jeff's pushing that question, some of these charts are a little bit hard to read uh, because it's a small screen. And 
you, you'll get the you'll get the charts afterwards. They'll tell you how you can get access to those. Uh, but also the, the important thing about this also is that the details of the chart are less important than the fact that the con they're making a conversation happen. But you will get the slides. So here's the poll. Which of these four areas we've talked about are pain points? Choose between one and four, any of them that are pain points. Go ahead and check all that apply and then press vote. And if all four of these are problems for you, don't feel bad. I think a lot of people are going to feel that way, uh, especially given the way that the, uh, the relationship question came up a little bit earlier. Okay, so here are the answers. IT cost and performance is a big one. Um, it really is interesting. Uh, we, we have this course here, Essential IT for Non-IT Executives. And when I ask people why they are in the room, they often say, IT is a black hole. Lots of stuff goes in, lots of money and attention. Nothing ever comes out. Now, we know it's not really that situation, but without transparency on cost and performance, um, it's a huge issue. And uh, as I'll show you in a second, uh, getting that one right is a great first step to fixing all the other ones. The other one that I think is interesting is prioritization um, because many people think they're really good at making decisions. Uh, but if you look at the typical IT steering committee meeting, um, there's not good decision making happening in, a, in that situation. There may be, it may look good, but often it, there's a lot of under the covers that's not being seen. So I, I, that, that makes a lot of sense on the prioritization. Uh, really clear on the prioritization one is pushing this post implementation review, what we call the harvest review. If you can put that in place, your prioritization process is going to get better. Um, that takes uh, some effort and some understanding and a little bit of willingness to uh, make some mistakes when you get started. Um, but every time I've seen an organization put this in, things get better. So the two ones, IT cost and performance prioritization, that's great for the slide that I'm going to show you next. So thank you for, thank you for sharing that information. So just as a last piece uh, about how to go through and, uh, you know, the, where do you start? And we talked about that a little bit. We found that getting from this idea of being a train wreck relationship to sweet, sweet love is a stepwise process. You do it in pieces, step by step. Uh, we call it from IT as support or order taker to IT as value driver or strategic partner. And you can see the differences there. Uh, when IT is a support organization, they just take orders, they just provide technology, and IT is just a cost of doing business. And you know what you feel about a cost of doing business. You, you don't feel good about it, but you just live with it. And when you're doing that, the rules of IT, they're just rules. They're just something that IT is doing to annoy the business and that IT feels that business isn't listening to. When IT becomes that value driver, when the relationship's good, it's a whole different story. Um, your strategic partner, your colleague, you're working together, and those rules are just how you work. There's, there's, you, you wouldn't think to not have the rules. And every investment also is not about just another cost of business. It's actually about how you're making the business better. So how, do, how does that happen? It happens stepwise. Number one is what we've called new thinking. And that's understanding that this is a marriage. This is not a vendor relationship. If you're thinking about your IT people as vendors, you got to change. And frankly, if you're IT people and you're thinking about the business as your customers, time to change that one too. I would never think of my wife as my customer. Um, we've got a relationship and we work, we work things together. Number two is the value for money. That's this idea of IT organization and performance. If IT is not, to not able to do the basic stuff right, it's hard to do the hard stuff like prioritization, right? So you just got to get in and do that, like the Intel did, uh, like many of the other examples that I shared have gotten into. Once that's ready, then you can move on to the hard challenge of new business value. And that's this prioritization thing. When you can put the prioritization and the accountability in, so that everything you spend on IT, you know exactly why you're spending it. And so you go back to figure out whether you got what you expected. If you're clear on why you're doing it, you make better decisions. And if you go back and figure out whether you got the value, you learn what's working and what's not. You learn how to make things better in, in the future. And you can move forward with value. That's that virtuous cycle. 
The last step, though, is also important, this extended value. That, that is the sweet, sweet love situation. You just get there. You've done the other ones, you get there. And that's where you don't have to think about this as being a relationship anymore that, that's a problem. It just works. That's when you can really, truly innovate with IT and, and drive your company forward. So thinking about this step by step, if you're on the business side, start doing the steps to manage this, these transparency problems. Go through these four elements. But if you're on the IT side, you don't need to wait for the business to want to change. If you're on the IT side, you can take these steps and things will get better. Because once you start showing the value for money, people are going to be more w willing to talk to you about how they're going to prioritize projects. And once you're doing that right, the marriage just gets to be a better situation and a new value comes out there. So we've reached kind of the end uh, of the presentation here. Um, do we have any more questions we want to talk through? Uh, sure. Thank you. There's one that came in uh, just as you were saying. That seemed very uh, timely. Uh, do you have uh, – can you talk about an example of the sweet love stage? Sweet love stage. You know what's interesting about the sweet love stage? Well, let's talk, let's talk about a couple examples. Uh, in, at Intel, they started by fixing that picture that I showed you. Uh, after a while, nobody wanted to talk about that picture because they realized the big problem was project governance and how to do that virtuous cycle. Once they fixed that, within a few years after, so 1998 was horrible train wreck, by 2008, IT is starting to take a critical role in developing innovation tools, methodologies, and even in coming up with new ways for the company to innovate. At that retail, that car retailer, uh, an $8 billion firm, IT went from being fat and happy, according to the CEO, to suggesting new ways to sell cars in a process of about six years. Uh, that sweet, sweet love situation is when the conversation is so good that IT can suggest something and the business listens, or the business says, here's a challenge, and the IT people have great answers to help solve it, and that's where you want to get. Great. Thank you. So just reading through some questions here. We have a few, that, uh, and I'll try to uh, push them together into, into one question that deals with a couple of these topics. Uh, Thinking about uh, companies and organizations that have already got to a stage that they're relying significantly on outsourcing, uh, or perhaps in a more recent trend towards uh, companies that might be looking at cloud computing as an approach that almost uh, obviates the need for the traditional IT department in some people's minds, if people find oh, in those kinds of organizations and businesses, how much of what you've just said still applies, or how would you apply it? I think in these situations, what, what I just said applies even more importantly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you've got a vendor relationship there where if you ask them for numbers on performance, they have to give it to you. And so ask. Um, you, you have contract relationships they need to live up to. And so at least the value for money piece should be part of the relationship you've already arranged. Now, people go to outsourcing for good reasons and for bad reasons. And they often outsource things because they can't manage it themselves. And in that situation, you need to work with your vendor to help improve things, uh, to make them better. But your vendors have a lot of incentive um, because you're paying them to make things better. Um, so that's the first step. As far as the project prioritization, often, you know, if your vendor owns an uh, application development, then you, you can insert yourself into the situation there and help, help with the prioritization process, where you do more prioritization before you go to them, and then they, they deliver on what you ask. Uh, or you can have them in the conversation if, if, if the trust is there. Um, what's interesting, though, in the sweet, sweet love stage, you get to the situation where, for example, like Campbell Soup a couple years back, um, CIO got a big budget cut, and she went back to her strategic partner outsourcer said, listen, I've got to save X millions of dollars. Help me find it. And rather than fighting over whether the billings were going to stay high, the outsourcer said, here, we'll find you half of that. We can find it half from these things that we're doing that are just we shouldn't be doing. And they took a little hit on revenues that year, but they knew more options were going to come up to build those things back up again. So depending, I think the same way that you talk about it you're, as an internal organization, with outsourcing, you do the same thing. Great, great. Thank you. We're getting a few questions coming in. Uh, and again, I'll try to put them into, uh, into one category question. That have to do with uh, this concept of the relationship and building uh, the, the relationship using your analogy of the, of the marriage. 
And I guess the two dimensions that um, I'm seeing questions about are, one, uh, how can you cope if one of the partners you know, sees the problem and wants to try to address it, but the other really is in calcitrant or won't acknowledge that there's, there's an issue? Maybe this so I I'm doesn't feel, feel familiar to people in their personal yeah. lives. But so, you know, like marriage counselors will be, be the first to tell you that both sides need to want to change. Uh, I will actually differ with that a little bit in this situation. Uh, we've looked at literally dozens of IT turnarounds. And while it's really nice if the business says, I'm going to support you in turning things around, we've seen it happen where the business had no intention whatsoever of talking to anybody. That the IT people just took it on themselves to say, this is a miserable situation, and if I'm going to stay in this job uh, without going crazy, I'm going to fix things. And so what they did is they went through that green arrow that we talked about. And what we talk about, uh, we talk about this a lot in that, in that book, The Real Business of IT. Step by step, by changing the way that you as IT people talk to the business side, you become the kind of person that the business side wants to talk to. And so, you know, some of the examples I shared were here, but also in that book, there's a lot of good information on there. Now, if you were on the business side and you feel like your IT people are just not wanting to communicate, um, you can fix that because you sign their paycheck, first of all. But second of all, these same techniques will work for you. Um, get started on the process. So, and a slight, thank you, a slight variation of that, uh, it may be a common situation for a lot of uh, IT people, is that actually, of course, they're dealing with a whole portfolio of business partners and clients, and some of them may be more receptive and some may be less. Uh, do you have any advice from your from your research on uh, what works in those situations? You know, I've signed, I've worked with hundreds of CIOs over the last ten years, and I would never want that job. Uh, like I said, they've got lots of responsibility and, and no authority to make it happen, and they've got lots of people, lots of situations where they make one person happy, and that makes five people unhappy. Um, if you are in a situation like that, where some people are just really being difficult with you, I think the best thing to do is find. Uh, Make somebody your friend, and the best person to make your friend I'm finding is the CFO. Uh, you might want to say that the CEO is a good person to be friend. That's great. Uh, but if you're in a large company, that CEO has got a lot of things on your mind, including Wall Street. Um, in a lot of companies, the CFO can be the best friend of IT because the CFO is all about transparency. The CFO is all about discipline. And so the CFO has ways of getting people to fall into line that a CIO you may never have. So, for example, this process I, I mentioned that uh, where the business units sign up for, they, they do the business cases, they sign up for money, and they have to come back and report what they got. It's the CFO driving that steering committee meeting. It's not the CIO driving. So it's important where the CIO sits in the organization and what the power base of the CIO is? I think, yeah, it, it's less important where you report. The, the minimal is on whether you report to the CIO, the CFO, where you are, because um, you're having conversations with everybody. But if you want to put that discipline and transparency in, the CFO can be your best friend. So another way of saying that, just looking at some other questions, don't blame the CIO. It may not be the, should I be firing my CIO if I'm having these problems? Or should you be should firing your CIO? Uh, I think you need to ask yourself a question. First of all, is the CIO being what they're being because they're incompetent or because they just don't understand? And most, if you're going to, about to change your CIO, realize you're changing out a whole lot of organizational knowledge that's going to take somebody a long time to replace. So, yeah, if that person's just being difficult to be difficult, of course you want to change them out. But if they don't understand, start the conversations and, uh, and then see what you can do. Oh, I, I, I want to say one other thing, Peter, on whether you've got difficult people and other not on the IT side. Um, this transparency can be very helpful there, too. Because if you, find, if you can put together the case that out of four big people you deal with, two are following your methods and things work for them. Projects go in on time, they get the value. Two are not following your methods, and these ones are falling apart. That's a very compelling case to make for your CFO. Great, thank you. Some other questions that, uh, that seem quite interesting, especially given that we're sitting here in MIT, where of course uh, we think a lot about innovation, and we've got some questions from from both sides of the of the house that relate to innovation. Uh, from the IT side, uh, some, I see some people wondering uh, if they understand your argument about making business cases. 
how do we make a business case for innovation and cutting edge IT investments where uh, there's a lot of, uh, they're not proven or tested uh, technologies. And uh, the flip side of that are some questions from the business side saying, you know, all right, we get the point that our IT organization, our CIO, is helping the company manage risk. Uh, we're trying to drive innovation in the business, and we need IT to do that. And these, uh, the management of risk is holding us back from being innovative. How do either side of that deal with that question? Let's take them one at a time. If you are on the IT side and you're making a case for cool new technology and they're not listening, then you shouldn't be making that case yet. I think you want to take a look and see have you, how far have you moved up that path. Are you providing value for money? Do they believe that you do what you, you're supposed to do reliably and at the right prices? And then are the projects that are being done, are you saying we need this cool new technology or are you saying that this cool technology will solve a specific problem for you and it's the best way to do things? Uh, so really ask yourself what, why you're having trouble making that case. On the other side, the innovation and security side, um, same question. Innovating the business is important, but often innovating the business can be done, so often you can innovate the business without having to do wildly crazy things on the technology side. And so, for example, bring your own device is a really interesting one, right? Everybody wants to use their iPhones and their iPads and everything. It's great, uh, but it opens up huge security problems in organizations unless they're managed the right way. And so if you can work with your IT people and say, if we wanted to bring your own device, how can we protect those devices? How can we make sure if those devices are lost, we can wipe them out? How can we figure out where they are to find them again? Then you can find a happy medium. But if you're just saying, I want to bring my own device, and I don't want to have, have the standards or extra stuff on my machine, you're, asking, you're, you're creating problems. And the CIO will, it has to, is the one who's going to be blamed for those. Great, thank you. We have still have a lot of questions coming in, but uh, looking at the time, I think we need to start wrapping up. But perhaps just one final uh, sort of category of question, uh, returning to something that uh, we started with, uh, would be taking all of these ideas on board. Uh, you know, we're all very busy as well. What is the one thing that uh, we could perhaps do this afternoon, tomorrow, maybe Monday morning? <laughs> Uh, that will really get us started on, on the kind of journey that you're talking about. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have a two-day executive education course for non-IT executives to come and learn some of these transparency things. And it, it's, a, it's a great course. We have a lot of people on the business side that, that come in and learn things a lot of, about how to communicate. You don't become technical experts. You become transparency experts. Uh, and by the way, out of every non-IT executive course we offer, there are probably 20% of them are IT people trying to learn how the other side lives. So that's number one. Sign up for our course. Uh, get, our, get the books. Read those. But what can you do tomorrow? I think what you can do tomorrow or even today is figure out which of these four things is causing you the most trouble and find somebody on the other side and have a conversation about it. You won't fix it immediately, but just starting the conversation is going to take you a long way along the way to... Um, improving communication, transparency, and moving up that path. Well, thank you very much, Dr. George Westerman. This has been uh, fascinating. Uh, one of the questions that we've been receiving throughout uh, this uh, webinar has been uh, people asking about receiving the copies of the slides. Uh, we will be sending those out to you. Uh, and I think also right now on your screen, you should be uh, seeing the reference material uh, for the two books that uh, we talked about. Uh, and also a link to uh, Dr. Westerman's research uh, center information uh, at the Center for Digital Business uh, at MIT. Uh, and hopefully you all also do already have uh, our executive education website, which is how you ended up in this webinar, executive.mit.edu. Uh, please come back and have a look at that website. And we have some more uh, information from uh, from George there and information about the uh, executive education course that he mentioned. Okay, so, so, it, so if you do, if you want to talk about any of these things, uh, you know, it's always talking to people on either side is also a research opportunity, so I'm happy to, to chat. Just send me uh, some information we can talk. Great, great. Thank you, George. So uh, with that, I think we're just about to wrap up now. Uh, watch out for, look, keep an eye out for an email from us, uh, which will include this, the uh, slides from this presentation. 
Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll see many of you again at the uh, next in our series, which is being planned for uh, the fall. Uh, the next, uh, I, I would be remiss like George not to mention that the, 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 the next offerings of essential IT for non-IT executives, the open enrollment course that George mentioned, uh, is November 15th to the 16th, 2012. Uh, we actually op op offer that course three times a year, uh, so uh, two or three times a year, I should say, so it'll run next in March, uh, meaning I think if you have, uh, if you're feeling some urgency around these issues, I would strongly recommend you jump onto the website now and uh, look about uh, enrolling as soon as you can. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions about any of our programs, feel free to contact us through the website. We'll be very happy to, uh, to help you understand all of those. So with that, I think it's time for us to sign off from uh, the MIT Sloan School, uh, from the Innovation Network webinar series, and we look forward to seeing you uh, all next time. And thank you very much again, George Westman. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's webinar. You may now disconnect.